All right, um, so it's three o'clock in Berlin. It's nine o'clock in the evening in Singapore and nine o'clock in the morning in Ontario. Um, just the right time to start today's event. Um, very warm welcome to everybody whom I'm seeing, uh, who's been joining over the past minutes. Uh, several friends, uh, several really well-known scholars. I'm very much looking forward to the debate to follow, just seeing the list of names that has popped up over the past minutes. Um, just to give you a very brief introduction also to the people who will watch this on YouTube afterwards, because this um, session is being recorded and is being live streamed on Facebook at the moment. So um, there might be some people watching that still have no idea what news is. So let me just briefly give you a brief introduction. My name is Clement Schneider. Um, I'm a founding member of NUS. NUS is the Network for Constitutional Economics and Social Philosophy founded about six years ago um, to facilitate the discourse, interdisciplinary discourse of um, scholars around the world that concern themselves with constitutional economics and social philosophy, of course, but also with a broad range of other subjects, matters, topics, um, from law to history, from philosophy to economics. Um, there's a very broad range and always broadening. And um, we really appreciate the fact that over the past one and a half years, um, due to the horrifying pandemic, we have found a way of better communicating with each other through the um, blessings of the internet. And we started a project called the New Spotlight, which is aimed at a smaller group of news members and young affiliates to um, enforce and facilitate and extend the academic network and um, exchange. And then we decided that we needed a second um, format to reach even more people. And this is the news white beam, which we are now witnessing the second edition. Uh, the white beam is supposed to address a broader public and to give many people the possibility of attending or at least listening to the scholarly discussions on various topics. And today's topic is determined by our two speakers, of course, um, Margaret Moore and Chandran Kukatas, who have both been working on the question of immigration, the question of migration, and this will be today's topic. So let me please um, briefly introduce our discussants today, which are Margaret Moore. Professor Margaret Moore is a professor of political studies and philosophy at Queen's University at Kingston in Ontario, holding the seat since 2005. Um, Margaret Moore has been working a lot about the theory of nation and of nation state, also of nationalism, uh, and always contrasting it and bringing it into dialogue with the theory of liberalism, which has been the topic of her first book, as far as I know. Um, her latest, or oh, the nearly latest book of 2015 was A Political Theory of Territory, which is also a book to which Chandran relates a lot in his uh, current uh, publication, which gave the title to today's um, wide beam event. And so I'm switching to introducing Professor Chandran Kukatas, who is now the Dean and Lee Kong Chian Chair, Professor of Political Science at the School of Social Sciences in uh, the Singapore Management University. And before that has been the head um, of the Department of Government at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, LSE. Chandran has been working a lot on pluralism as well as on Friedrich August von Hayek, who for many of us is an important figure. And Chandran proves how well these two work together. Uh, which might come as a surprise to some people who um, 
well, at least want to follow Hayek, and which might come as a surprise to many people who love pluralism, uh, that the two of them are very well reconcilable. Um, next to his very important groundbreaking book, The Liberal Archipelago, um, he just recently published this book, Immigration and Freedom, uh, which is also sort of the basis of today's discussion. So without further ado, I would love to give the word to our two main characters of today's wide beam, Margaret Moore and Shannon Krikotas. <laughs> Margaret, if you would like to start by giving us a brief overview of your thoughts on the question of immigration freedom, a little introduction into your mind. So this is like a 10 minutes introduction, the one you told me. Okay. So I guess first I want to thank the organizers, Clement Schneider and Karen Horn for inviting me. It's like a privilege to be here in conversation with Chandran Kukuthis, whose work I've admired for a long time. And I mean, I would encourage everybody to read this book because it is a very original and innovative take on the problem of immigration. And part of it is in a kind of conversation with my work which and so I, I disagreed with some of it because the conversation isn't always a, an agreement. Um, so I did want to say three points about the book, and I think these points are uh, do address the kind of wider uh, themes of the book. And the first is perhaps a little bit methodological, but there are lots um, and uh, connected to the use of all kinds of egregious injustices with um, um, in, um, migration. The second is about the li liberty, li his central theme about the liberty limiting effects of immigration restrictions on the society as a whole. And then the third, which I think I probably can't get to in 10 minutes, is connected to that I think he doesn't take as seriously as he could the rival arguments that theorists of territory have made. And that has meant that he didn't really always address maybe some of the questions that I thought he should address. So let me just start with the first. Um, Chandran uses a lot of examples of the egregious injustices connected to restrictive immigration. Um, but it's difficult at times to separate, and I agree that they were all unjust, like severe injustices, but it's difficult to separate those cases from the, from the claim that there's an essential freedom denying nature of immigration controls. And by this, I mean, um, I mean, we normally distinguish theories and, and principles from the way in which these decisions, these principles are implemented. So his examples are really compelling. I mean, in one case, I was, um, you know, the idea that the US border authority was authorized to do sweeps, checking along the border, checking workplaces, raids, and house to house inspections of Mexican looking people in the US. Um, but we, we distinguish liberal principles from the practices of societies that are, are that call themselves liberal. And so Chandran has throughout the book all kinds of cases of egregious injustices practiced by immigration hostile regimes as if they're central to migration itself. And all these cases are cases where there's a serious miscarriage of justice, bureaucracy run amok, overstepping the bounds of the rule of law, unable to examine compassionate cases, um, wielding too blunt an instrument, or simply like too incompetent to make decisions of such import on people's lives. But we need to know whether it's integral to the system and also especially integral in what ways. So are these injustices fundamental to immigration as a practice? So my question there was, is it not possible to have an orderly system of migration and do it in less unjust and arbitrary ways? So I personally believe that the problem is quite deep, rooted in the fact that the people who suffer from the system are by and large people who don't vote. They have no avenues of appeal, um, no democratic say in how the system operates. There's no one really guarding the guardians here and this should be addressed. So that when there are egregious injustices like the ones he points to, which are numerous and could be multiplied many times, um, there are avenues of appeal and bureaucrats held to account. But that's a different diagnosis than the one that Chandran makes, where he sort of where he argues that migration restrictions are themselves a fundamental threat to human freedom and also just as much the freedom of residents and citizens. So that was a question about how those examples are used. They don't necessarily lead to his conclusion. So that brings me to the second point, and that's the fundamental argument of the book, which is 
um, immigration controls are restrictions on human freedom. And what makes this original and innovative is that he's not talking about the freedom of would-be migrants which a lot of open border theorists have talked about when they assert a, a right to freedom of movement. Rather, what is at stake is, quote, the liberty of citizens and other residents of the free society and therefore a freedom itself. So he points out that um, border con that migration controls aren't really controls at the border. They're controls on the freedom of the population residing with within the border. And so to think about that, consider a person who wants to help refugees. So immigration laws don't just stop refugees from arriving, but they criminalize the behavior of people who help refugees, who help them come into a country because it transforms them into people smugglers. I think this is very insightful, and but it's actually potentially problematic for an open borders advocate because um, Chandran shows that immigration restrictions are not primarily boundary uh, issues. And so it looks like what the claim is, is that the correct way to think about it is that the state uses its jurisdictional authority over a domain to make rules. The rules are over a whole range of things in our lives, lots of them liber liberty limiting. And one of those rules is about immigration. So if the state is exercising its jurisdictional authority in the state, so there's a kind of very libertarian bent here, right? Because that's liberty limiting. Um, um, the, to the extent that it looks like it's happening at the border is a bit of an illusion because what's really happening is that the state uses its authority to say, everybody in the domain has to have a birth certificate of a certain kind or a visa of a certain kind to remain in the state. So it looks like it's exercising power at the border, but in fact, it's ordinary jurisdictional authority. It's just easier administratively or more efficient to check whether people have the right documents before they arrive rather than let them arrive and then uh, go to the expense and trouble of deporting them. So that shows that in the, at least on that account, it makes my great ish, rules about migration and immigration a kind of direct exercise of jurisdictional authority applied across the state, the geographical domain, rather than some kind of special power over people outside, outside and at borders. So this could be worrying for an open borders theorist, because now if you think of Arish Bazita's argument, for example, where he argues that the problem with immigration is that it's, a pro it's, it's, a, it's applied to people who are excluded. Now it seems that actually, Immigration is a kind of ordinary exercise of jurisdictional authority, and we just have to consider the, limit, the liberty limiting elements. And it raises the, um, so it, it, so there, it doesn't, it's not clear it requires the special justification that a lot of open borders theorists require or have asked for. And it raises the following problem. What if people want these restrictions? What if people support liberty limiting rules for whatever reason? In fact, what if it's not simply a preference, it's not just like they have a preference, but what if there's normative value realized uh, that is realized in ensuring that people have collect as political communities, collective control over their lives, including their capacity to make rules over it. So of course, if the reason behind the immigration rules are racist or xenophobic, we shouldn't accept it. But if those reasons are non-racist, about the appropriate flow of migrants relative to jobs or housing supply or healthcare and many other ordinary policies and institutions that the state has a responsibility to keep in good order, then, um, then it, it, it does seem that, that, I mean, we have a question here, right? I, I mean, it might be that they're liberty limiting, but it might be that, they, that there's a balance of values here. So I realize that these don't need to be zero sum in the real world, you know, the tension between the flow of migrants, but um, and 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 um, various policies. But suppose there really is a trade-off between an op a, a, a permissive immigration policy that no no rules about uh, about migrants, and our capacity to control the collective conditions of our lives. So I personally think that liberal capitalist societies have a lot more capacity to um, handle potential migrants, to increase the flow of migrants than uh, most regimes think. And I also think we have remedial obligations, but 
Um, but suppose there is that kind of, there is a sort of possible, a conflict. And here what I mean by a conflict is something like a pot, to consider the possibility that, well, no individual migrant seeking to live peaceably in a political community is at all undermining of that community's collective self-determination. In fact, that migrant has a very, might, may have very good reasons to come, um, which actually should be considered. Um, it doesn't follow that the influx of millions and millions of people without any state control over migration might, I mean, that might be damaging to a collective, to collective self-determination. So, um, so I think here, what, um, so there's a kind of burden of proof argument here, right? Which is, do we, um, which is the idea that we should justify um, exclude uh, these rights, uh, territorial rights, for example, to each affected individual and especially excluded individuals rests on a fallacy of composition. It infers that something is true of the whole from the fact that that thing is true of some part of the whole or even every part of the whole, but that's not true. And we know this from zero sum games like athletic races, where the fact that someone would win if she ran faster does not mean that everyone would win if everyone ran faster. In the case of the regulation of migration, a single uh, prospective migrant will certainly not have a deleterious effect on the self-determination of the political community, but it doesn't follow that millions of migrants entering one's political community will have no effect on the self-determination of that community. It might indeed be hard for the state to manage or make effective policy decisions, like ensuring affordable housing, maintaining good health care and education, and so on. That's why migration is difficult. I think there's a balancing here because we sympathize with the plight of individual migrants. These migrants often have very good reason to come, but it doesn't follow that there's no, um, that having millions of people migrating doesn't have an effect on the collective self-determination. So my suggestion was that if the Chandran actually should have considered this potential problem, this, this. And in fact, I'm gonna say that I think he does. And what he says basically is something akin to what Margaret Thatcher said, which is that there is no political community. There is no real community. Um, and there's no real associational relationships of any significance. And um, I think that brings us to the actual tension between our views, because I think there, there is value in having in collective self-determination. Although actually, I, I'm, I'm actually for more migration, but I think that there are associational relationships of significance and that um, what Chandran sees as the root of the problem, which is this, this idea that we have membership, I think, um, I think uh, needed to be taken more seriously in, in the way it was explored in the book, because I thought it was somewhat polemical. And um, uh, I also thought that by not considering, by just assuming we have no real society or political or community, I thought in a way he threw out the baby with the bathwater because um, there are a lot, if we don't have any kind of idea about territory and membership, I think there's lots of things we can't explain. And so I'm gonna make that point later on and close right now, so, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. That was a, a very good summary of the first points of critique, and you already aim at the points I would like to uh, talk about with you later on, um, especially the question of um, how communities actually exist and how they justify themselves and their being. Um, but now I first would like to um, give the word to Chandran, for an introductory remark, you might already want to relate to things that Margaret has said, but maybe just um, start by giving us a first impression of um, your main lines of thought. Okay, thanks very much, um, Clemens. And again, thank you to Nus and to you and Karen for organizing this. And Margaret, I really appreciate your uh, doing this because I, I really did want to have uh, a proper engagement with uh, someone who really knows this material and, and gets the book. So um, it's, it's, it's great to be here. So rather than try to um, simply summarize the book, I might do a couple of things. One is say a little bit about how I came to write the book in the way that it turned out, and then use that as a basis for picking up a couple of things that that Margaret said. Um, I originally set out to write a book in defense of open borders. I thought I would write a, a short 
50,000 word book, I would get it over and done with halfway through my sabbatical and then turn my attention to other things. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. And six years later, uh, the book appeared quite different a product than I originally imagined. Uh, and one of the things I decided to do was not to write a defense of open borders. There are a couple of reasons for this. One was that um, I thought that um, it would lose me audience. Um, another was that um, I began to think that uh, the, the notion of open borders was simply under theorized in any case, and most people who advocated open borders didn't really have a clear sense of, of what, it, what it meant. So I decided I would not write a book on open borders. Almost everyone who reads the book still thinks it's a book about open borders and not surprisingly in one way, because I have written other papers called things like why open borders and a defense of open borders. So um, somehow the message has got out that I'm in favor of open borders. Um, in a way that's right, I am, but I also have very particular views about what we might understand by open borders. So what I decided to do was to write a book about the impact of immigration control, not so much on migrants, but on the kind of society that immigration control has to foster or foment in order for immigration controls to work uh, at all. Uh, the main thesis is that what it must involve is a diminution of uh, the freedom of the population because controlling would-be immigrants and especially people who've moved into a country and might remain as immigrants, controlling them would require not so much controlling their movement as controlling what they do. That is to say, whether they enter the labor market, whether they um, rent property, whether they marry other citizens or residents. And controlling this would necessarily involve controlling citizens and residents. But the point I wanted to make was not so much that once you've got immigration control at all, you immediately get a closed society and a complete loss of freedom. On the contrary, what I want to draw attention to is the trade-off involved. And that is to say, the more seriously you try to control immigration, the more you're read down the path of controlling your own citizens. Now, we've had immigration control in countries of the developed West, of the modern East, of uh, the United States for at least 100 years, and possibly, depending on how you look at it, going back two or 300 years to the extent that movement has never been completely free. But what I wanted to suggest is that the greater the, the, the effort to really control this, the greater the extent to which you're going to see a diminution of freedom. There is a trade-off. I think most of the literature on immigration has focused on a different kind of trade-off. What is the impact of immigrants on the economic welfare of a society? And what I want to say is, let's look at a different trade-off. But there's nothing in what I want to say that, that argues that an inevitable um, consequence of any immigration control is going to be a complete diminution or loss of freedom. That's, that's not it. So I think a lot of the debate ultimately will still, the way I want to see it, be about um, how much immigration control we want, how much we can, um, uh, we can tolerate, in a sense, if we care about um, our own freedom. And of course, this is important in part because in every society, every political society, there is substantial disagreement to the extent that some people want more immigration, some people want less, some people want none. Okay? And I'm not taking a, a side on this particular uh, debate in the sense that I'm not saying this is the level we should reach. I'm simply trying to say, here is the trade-off. So the purpose of all of the illustrations is to say, the more you go down the path of immigration control, the more you run the risks of these kinds of injustices. And the injustices I've tried to pick up are primarily uh, one that involve the loss of freedom.
Now, in the second half of the book, I try to address those uh, objections to my view. And there are three kinds. One is the, uh, the economic objection that says this will be economically harmful, especially to the poor. The second objection is that it'll um, lead to uh, cultural loss. And then the third kind of objection I address is the objection that says, well, we need to control immigration in order to have a political community that's self-determining. So I won't say much about the sec first two objections, but I'll say a little bit about the, the final one since that's the one that Margaret has, uh, I think, picked up on. And I think here, what I want to say is that I, I don't want to suggest that there isn't such a thing as a political community. I regret that you know I've given this impression, um, my fault. I mean, I should have written the book in a way that didn't give uh, this impression. In, in an earlier book, The Liberal Archipelago, that Clemens mentioned, I do actually uh, address the issue directly, um, arguing against John Rawls, who says that, uh, um, that there isn't such a thing as a, as a political community. And, and I say that there is. He has a different way of trying to understand political order, but he doesn't think you can use it in terms of a community. And I, I thought you could. Um, but what I'm more skeptical of is um, the extent to which people think that, firstly, this is something that um, gives you a warrant for controlling immigration, particularly given that within a community there are different views. Uh, and I'm skeptical about the idea that a lot of immigration um, is going to be destructive of political community, because I think there are plenty of examples where there has been much, much more immigration that we've seen in most countries today without a loss of political community, which is not to say there couldn't be serious disruptions, um, but for the most part, I think there hasn't been a loss of political community. So. Uh, as I say, I don't want to, to, to um, overstate the significance of political community because I'm also very skeptical of it in many respects. I'm skeptical of the idea that political community is self-generating, for example, because I think the role that political elites play in creating it is much greater than people have, uh, have recognized. But I, I don't want to um, say that there is no political community or that it doesn't matter. I just want to be a lot more wary about its importance, about its significance, and about the, the danger to it. So maybe I'll stop there rather than keep going so that the, uh, um, you know, both my views and Margaret's can unfold through discussion rather than through uh, a longer speech. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chandran. Um, just for all the participants, we will have a at first, a discussion between three of us, uh, especially between Margaret and Chandran, which I would just try to slightly moderate. Um, and then after about 20 to 30 minutes, we will uh, very happily include you. So make up your minds, whether you have comments or questions or critique, um, try to sum them up and uh, then we will be very happy to include them and to try and uh, weave the net of um, ideas and of understanding even broader uh, in the next step of our conversation. Um, so first, I would, I, I'm, I'm very glad you both uh, addressed those questions of um, community, of the identity of a community, because I think they are especially interesting. Um, and they are issues which have not been addressed as much as other issues, like, for example, the, the economic um, side of migration. Um, but they have a very um, decisive role in today's debates. Um, and I think we need to get into them more thoroughly in order to understand how those debates work and how liberals from very different perspectives might uh, want to join these debates and try to influence them um, regarding the extent of extending of freedom. So let me just maybe start by the by one very general question, but I think it's an important question. Um, the concept of the foreigner is closely tied to those um, features of states that define the question of migration too. So 
you have people to whom there is a sort of obligation nowadays mostly through the welfare state but also by sharing other um, parts of a modern state like infrastructure for example or security um, and that uh, kind of stuff and some people might partake in this because they they have been born in the same country um, and others are considered foreigners because um, they are not born in the country or they're not born to parents from the country or whatever they're different concepts obviously um, so what what is behind this uh, a, a little bit peculiar concept as I would say because I mean most people in your country are still foreigners or at least strangers to you aren't they um, maybe Margaret if you would just give a brief comment on that or how do you see oh, that well, I don't know if I have anything to say about that but um, because um, I mean, I don't make use of that concept at all. I mean, there are people inside political communities with, with whom you have certain kinds of relations and there's people outside political communities and you may have relations with them too. So I, I actually think that the language of, you know, strangers or foreigners is a way to, to, to um, um, is, is actually kind of problematic. So I'm not going to, I think I'm, maybe, maybe I even agree with Chandran here. I mean, the idea of strangers, like you're, I don't know, my mother used to say, don't talk to strangers, right? They, there's something negative and bad about them. And I, I just actually think that that might be a kind of polemical concept. So, so I, um, But still you, you would have people who are entitled to certain things, certain services, goods of the state and others who aren't, right? Right. So um, I think that I, I think there might I think when we have institutionalized mechanisms of cooperation in which people agree to redistribute, then you do have um, different forms of entitlement. But I, I and, and if you can th and and um, and, and it may be that, that we, we may want to des describe these entitlements differently. But I live in Kingston and I can only access library books in Kingston. If I go to my neighboring city in Gananoque and I don't have a municipal whatever, I can't use their library card. Why is that? It's because the property taxes in Kingston pay for those libraries. So, I mean, if we think about political communities as, create, as making rules to the, that create kinds of goods and they're for people within, this, within the community um, I, it, and within these institutions of cooperation, then it does turn out that we have deeper, our distributive obligations might be more extensive in some places than in others. I mean, I actually think we have distributive obligations that are global, but um, but I, I don't think that makes the people outside strangers. It means that they have a, their own political community and there may be different kinds of distributive obligations. But yes, I think that follows from the idea of a political community as something that creates rules and institutional practices which may have redistributive effects. And then would you would you agree on that or what's your take on that? Um, well, maybe I, should, I, I might engage this question by um, alluding to something that I make quite a, a bit of in, in my book, and, and that is the um, the way in which um, our identities and our you know, our foreignness is in fact not something that's somehow uh, naturally given, but is you know constantly being created and recreated because of a number of factors, including uh, political factors and including the um, um, the, the wish to control immigration. So a part of my point in the book was to say that one of the first ways in which one uh, tries to control immigration is by the act of classification, but by deciding uh, or by somebody deciding who is to count as a potential national or native and who is to count as a um, <clears throat> as as a foreigner, there's a good book in, on this in the case of the United States by a guy called Kunal Parker on called, just called Making Foreigners. Uh, and a part of the, the, the story here is that people have been turned into foreigners and turned back into natives periodically for a variety of uh, reasons, often to do with uh, 
the, the politics of a of a place. So the the significance uh, of this, I think, is that uh, at least for the for the issue of immigration, is that one has to be, I think, more on one's guard than than many societies have been when immigration control or its necessity is invoked, because often what's considered is only whether or not people should be allowed in. But what's not given, I think, sufficient consideration is how is the classification taking place? How is it that you're suddenly classified as someone who is not entitled to be there, who's classified as a foreigner? In the UK, the obvious uh, and most dramatic example of this recently is the, uh, the Windrush generation case, where people were, in fact, probably born British subjects or citizens. Um, but you know, later on, I think because of the anti-immigrant atmosphere, were hastily essentially reclassified as uh, as foreign when they when they simply weren't. The other example I'd use is the case of the uh, of the British Empire, of course, which you know at the um, early part of the last century regarded everybody or Britain regarded everybody who was a part of the empire as a British subject. And over the years, um, the, um, the the number of subjects was contracted. So again, foreigners were invented um, or created. And I think this is a simply, a, you know, all I want to say at this point is that uh, this gives us reason to be wary of, uh, you know, people who want to just start the debate automatically as if uh, it's settled who is in and who is out, who belongs, who doesn't. I think what we have is um, a, a debate and a public policy issue that's about all of these things, about who should and who shouldn't be allowed to come in, but who is and isn't a part of us in the first place. And this, I understand, has to do also a lot with the, the forming of nations, uh, which brings us also to a, a subject that Margaret has been concerning herself over for decades, I guess. Um, so how do these nations um, arise? And when I was thinking about this question, I thought, well, mm -hmm. you have nations that are really young. I mean, we're just, uh, in Europe, we're just experiencing uh, an age of tension between Kosovo and uh, Serbia. And Kosovo is the youngest nation in Europe, I believe, um, which has been just forming itself over the past 30 years. Um, and many African colonies um, and, and also even uh, South uh, American colonies have been like molded into nations by the mere fact of them being part of one or another European country. On the other side, you have examples of countries which have been or nations which have been existing for a very long time, like Japan, of course, um, but also France in, in Europe. So France is a very considerably stable nation. Uh, Portugal is another one. Uh, maybe you could even take something like Ethiopia, I guess, um, which have been nations for, for really hundreds of years and have been forming a national identity as opposed to others who are very young. So um, how stable and rigid are these nations? I guess, uh, Chandran, you would say, well, they're very, very um, fluid, whereas maybe um, Others might argue that they do have some consistency and that there is some stability in the concept of nation. Um, I, I would say that it varies a lot. Um, what I would, I think, be more likely to, to question is the, um, is the spontaneity of the emergence of nations. Um, I think most narratives try to present um, nations or states as arising out of, um, in some sense, natural relations that uh, obtain between a group of people. Hence, you know, a lot of uh, theorizing about it uses um, metaphors such as the social contract theory to give, you know, um, expression to this idea that nations emerge because people come together and decide on things. And, and my view is that um, if you want to understand how political collectivities emerge, you have to look much more closely at uh, the people who are doing the, 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 the creating. 
Uh, and I think most of the time this happens, you know, I think sociologically, um, because there are struggles for power among different um, uh, elite groups. Uh, and, you know, a part of the establishment of power means establishing uh, territorial claims, although much more so recently than in the past, when it was difficult to actually uh, settle and police the the boundaries of a of a territory. But now, once someone has gained control over, let's say, a territory or a population, the the trick for anyone um, using small numbers to control a large number of people is to bring them into the story so that they think that this is legitimate. <clears throat> and one of the best stories is that we all belong together. And so I think that the, the, not only the history of thought, but, but history itself is just littered with stories of this kind. And I think they take root. Um, and so people do form attachments to nations, to territories, to people. Um, and they do this repeatedly. I mean, one of the examples I cite in my book is the case of, you know, the, the contest between rugby league players in Queensland and New South Wales. It become quite bitter, uh, even though, you know, everybody's Australian. But once you, you know, give them an identity and then someone has an interest in, in, uh, in fostering it and nurturing it, it can become pretty powerful. And it's just something that we also need to be wary of, even though there are benefits. So. Uh, I, th I think the, the whole question, to go back to the beginning, uh, of the, the nature of the foreigner is important because it brings out the fact that our identities, um, not just fluid, but they're constantly being recreated uh, and much of the creation is done by other people um, who have an interest in this. Um, can I... I didn't hear. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, at this point, at this part of the argument in Chandran's book, I just want to say two things, and they bear on the last point that Chandran made, which is, I mean, there's really two moves here, and one move is to describe the problem, the real problem that we're facing with immigration or with, with, with so the trade-off is supposed to be migration control and freedom, but actually freedom is a pretty important value and migration control as Chandran just stated it, like what is the value behind migration control? If that's really the, 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 the trade-off, then it, it has to go for freedom, right? Because I mean, I think human freedom is important. So unless you describe the contr migration control in terms of deeper values, then you, you haven't really described the problem. I think I want to say the first thing. So then Chandran says, well, look, there, there's a root of the problem. And he has two moves here. And he just dated the second move. But the first move is to describe people who think that they're the, the underlying problem, he says, lies in a certain way of thinking about the relationship between society and its members or its inhabitants. And that's the, the idea the society is made up of members. But here, when he discusses it, so at the beginning of the section, um, he begins with cultural restrictions on immigration with Enoch Powell's racist 1968 Rivers of Blood speech. And there it looks like almost any discussion of the social consequences of immigration are inherently racist. I actually disagree with the cultural argument, but I, um, and I think it is problematic, but then a whole range of arguments like Brian Pevnik's and Jeremy Waldron's and mine, in which there's no culture mentioned, right? They're political nations are discussed in really similar terms. So um, where the idea is that there are, um, there's a, politi a community, political community has developed through its processes, identities and relationships which are aimed at being collectively self-determining over the conditions of our existence and it's important for people in these relations to have mechanisms of make of, of making collective decision over valuable goods so he so Chandran moves from a characterization of those cultural arguments to then describe these other views like including mine this is where I thought it was polemical and uh, Ryan Pevnik's which are political accounts as based on and there's a quote, blood, soil, and belonging, which suggests they're ethnic in a really recalcitrant and problematic way. And I think if that they were like that, if that was the alternative, it would be deeply problematic. So on the one hand, these views are described as cultural or even racist. And I, I think, I think then, then they are problematic. But then on the other side, Chandran has the argument he just gave now, which is, look, political sovereignty and political projects are largely mythical. And so 
if they are largely mythical, I think the idea is, why would you give them institutions of political self-determination that transforms these inchoate sentiments and values into structures that permit decision-making? There's really nothing behind it, or it's an elite given project. And um, so uh, this argument, I think is a, like the argument that Chandon just make is a really like an interesting argument because I agree that the history of state building is often a history of elite efforts to gain control over territory and maybe subdue the population and then construct a narrative. And, um, but I think there's a danger here of a kind of genetic fallacy here, right? Which is that People, my argument and people who make non-cultural arguments about political self-determination don't really claim that it was born of initial feelings of solidarity. The claim is that where they exist for whatever reason, and we do have feelings of co-membership and we do have feelings that we want to control the political project that we have and um, control over the places that we live, then these interests are valuable. These relationships are valuable and people can create political communities. So. I mean, for example, so I live in Canada and there's not really strong cultural differences between Canadians and Americans, but they are different political projects and Canadians would resist being incorporated into the American political project, which is what Americans have wanted for a long time right, to take over us. And <laughs> there, it might be valuable that we get to decide how we want to construct our institutions and our um, and and um, and, 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 and organize our collective life together, that that's valuable locally and it's valuable for political communities who feel that they have a different kind of project. And the reason I worry that that's a genetic, that this whole argument about elite given, like, so there's the cultural argument, which I think is, which is problematic where it exists, but not generalizable, but the elite project, I mean, it is a little bit of a genetic fallacy in that it assumes that the historical origin of these political communities makes them, um, condemns them always to be problematic. So to see the problem here, suppose I think that the origins of the family was an original act of violence, men over women, maybe born of domination and rape. Suppose it were true that that was its origin. But as long as the family can be constituted on other grounds like mutual respect or love and equality, then the origin of the family doesn't necessarily determine its value. Its value could be in the institutions and the goods that are created, which we want to preserve. And I actually don't think that migration is necessarily a problem, but maybe millions and millions would, might undermine it. And that ha has to be considered. And that, that that value has to be what's the trade off between increased migration and the political community and not, I mean, I mean, that's the trade off, right? Not just increased controls over migration. It's the political community itself. And so that elite given argument, um, I think is a genetic fallacy. And just a kind of third point, um, you know, the elite argument is a, is a, a, a kind of compelling argument, but it does have a, a kind of a problem, which is that elites want to mobilize people on all different kinds of axes, right? I mean, and, and, and it's not clear why some are successful and some aren't. Some states aren't successful where the elites try and they don't create political communities. So, we, so it's not the case that elites can just have, have all these instruments and then can create political communities. They don't. The political communities are in some way, it has to be accepted by the people in some kind of way where people identify with it. I mean, I don't know how to test this always, but there has to be some kind of uh, idea of popular sovereignty where what's at issue is the, the connection of the people to the to to the state, and so it can't just just be an elite given project because some of them fail, and sometimes elites try to mobilize communities on other grounds, like more real grounds, like maybe class, and are unsuccessful. So the elite argument is not sufficient on its own, and it also I think suffers from imagining that the origin of something determines its value, and I think that's not true. Can I just jump in there? Because I think there's an interesting point which is um, coming up there. Um, so both of you pointed out that people actually feel attachment to a state or to a nation. Um, now, I think we have 
different concepts of um, feeling attachment there. So if I take my own home country's example of Germany, um, this national awakening, which happened in the 19th century was prompted as well by elites as by a more grassroots movement uh, coming out of, yeah, well, you could call it cultural elites, but it was uh, readily uh, adapted and easily adapted by, by the common folks, um, that there is something like the Germanness which binds us together. At the same time, simultaneously, we have another nation by choice, uh, which would be your southern neighbor, uh, Margaret, the, the United States, where people actually um, well, felt this attachment to this new project. So they built, they built a nation instead of um, sort of inventing one or finding one maybe one could say. Uh, so th this, this also ties maybe to the migration question because the US was a nation which was built by immigrants which is why for a long time, maybe they did readily accept more immigrants because they wanted people to contribute to this building of the nation. Whereas other nations were, were built or were formed by like a more um, inward looking process. Does that, does that like have impact on how the nation and migration work together in the, in the common understanding? A channel maybe? Or oh, Margaret, whoever. Um, well, let, let, let me let me weigh in on on this. Um, I actually agree with with most of what Margaret has had to say. Um, and one thing I I don't want to do is to um, you know to to overstate the <clears throat> the significance. <clears throat> of the fact that um, you know, states or nations are the creation of elites. And I, I completely accept her um, analysis uh, of this. At the same time, I think one of the things that I want to do is address those who are actually going in the opposite direction, who want to emphasize the um, uh, the the nature of the, uh, the political community or the nation or the state as something that has actually a, um, uh, a deeper genetic origin. And, and what I want to say in drawing attention to the, um, the role of elites, and this is why it appears mostly in chapter seven on, on uh, the state and on self-determination, is to say to people, be more wary of those who are advancing arguments for immigration control on the grounds that this is giving you self-determination, you know, that this is you taking back control. What I want to say is actually you're, you're not getting back control because at that point, um, the people who are in control are the people who are um, the beneficiaries of this particular uh, this particular argument, and even more so if you consider the fact that on matters like immigration, what there is is in fact, um, to varying degrees, significant disagreement across the society. Some people want to welcome more people. Some people uh, want not to welcome them. Obviously, some kind of decision has to be made um, because you have got institutions, you have got boundaries, you can't have lawlessness, so you, you've got to make a choice. But um, <clears throat> what I want to attack is the idea that it's only when you move towards restricting immigration that you are in fact taking back control. Okay? You could just as easily take back control by deciding to admit more, but no one is saying this. Okay, Nigel Farage certainly doesn't say, yes, we've decided happily to admit another million migrants, because we've decided this collectively. Because at that point, what anybody would say to him is that, no, it's not. That's some elite that's managed to get that outcome. Okay? But if it goes the other way, if you manage to reduce immigration, um, no one then you know, sits up and says, well, hang on, isn't this just 
the success of one particular part of the elite. So that's the thing that I want to, to draw attention to. It's not that somehow the fact that states have elite origins makes them illegitimate. Um, you know, the question of the legitimacy of the state is, I think, a much more complicated uh, uh, issue. But I don't think I need to settle that one to, to make the kind of argument that I want to make. And as I said, I, I, I don't disagree with most of uh, Margaret's uh, uh, analysis, but I think we're putting the emphasis in different places here. I, I mean, one of the difficulties is, right? Like, so I think this raises the problem about how to understand the examples. So um, I agree with you that Nigel Farage in the idea of taking back control or even Brexit. I mean, these are political slogans used to mobilize people that are that probably that are not, I mean, they're not very intellectually sound, right? There's no real analysis of what the needs of the society. There isn't really so I I mean so but if you if you think that every discussion, but I don't think you should assume that all discussions that are about what is the balance to be drawn between having um, in, in describing migration or describing you know, how we how many what are the processes by which we should admit migrants and um, who is it who 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 counts how we should determine those that all of these become arguments about that are that in which they become assimilated to people like Nigel Farage right I mean I think uh, these yeah. are. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a real difficulty with with saying, OK, so so some elites have used these arguments. I th And maybe the right, right answer is to say. Is to engage with them on the grounds on the, in, in the substance of their arguments and to show that they're flawed, not to think that all that all discussions of immigration turn out to be this kind of right wing. Um, 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 anti-immigrant diatribe, right? So. Well, for the most part, you know, um, my, my target audience is, is less the, uh, the Nigel Farage's or the, um, uh, the right-wing uh, anti-immigrant people, because I, I'm not sure they're really that interested in my, my arguments. Um, mostly it's, uh, you know, it's addressed to people like you and Ryan Pevnik and David Miller and so on who are, um, you know, um, on the reasonable end of the, uh, the debate, which is where I want to, to engage it. Um, but, you know, I, um, I, I can't ignore, although I only mentioned, I think, Farage once, I, I can't ignore these sorts of uh, uh, arguments uh, either. But I, I take your point that, you know, there, there is a difference. Um, so, one point you you're making, Margaret and, and Chandran, you're also acknowledging um, is that um, societies can at least feel limits of adapting to change. Uh, they can they can have the impression that there is a certain amount of uh, change which is represented by migration, by people coming into the country that are somehow different or is perceived as different. Um, that is not manageable anymore. Um, I guess you might both have some different perspectives on where those limits lie and how they are determined. Would you like to address that at least briefly, the, the, the limits of migration, the natural ones and the perceived ones? Well, let me jump in just uh, briefly on this. Um, I think it's actually very difficult to say because um, in a way, the way that question would often be, be read is as saying that um, there's a limit to the extent that an obvious um, you know, context or region will adapt or will not adapt to uh, a change. Whereas what's actually going to happen uh, more often than not, is that if you admit a, a lot of extra people, um, the the impact will be different in different parts of uh, of a of a community, whether it's uh, the state or whether it's uh, a region. So to say something like, "Well, you know, we can't cope with 
this sort of influx? Well, actually, it may be that some people can, some people can't. Um, some regions can, some people, some regions can't. This would be as much the case for internal migration, which is much vaster than uh, external or international migration uh, by you know, quite a large uh, factor. I, th I think that is a kind of reality. Uh, I think the question to ask then is, okay, how, do we, how do we address this? Because people are moving all the time, often because people want to move, often because others want them to move because of the, the, the need for labor or for you know, any of a host of reasons. So I think there's, you know, usually the question is just read one way, but I think there's another way of looking at it too. I actually, I mean, maybe we should have to open it up soon, but I, I, I agree that it's very difficult to know the answer to that question because, um, I mean, it, it does, because it, it does look like in liberal capitalist societies, we can handle much greater rates of immigration, migration than we, than we, than immigration restricting regimes think. Right, because I mean, the point of living in this kind of society is often that our skill sets are transferable, that you can enter the market, the economic marketplace, you can make be contributing members of society. So I think actually they're much greater than than the regimes think, and the people who support and some of the and some of the people who are at least the evidence in Canada, and I'm not actually a migration expert, I've written on territory, but I, I do know that some of the evidence in Canada suggests that people who live in neighborhoods where there have been high migration are actually more supportive of, of immigration and not just actually the migrants, but actually the people who live there than people who live in, in homogeneous community, white communities in, the, in rural areas. So they have an idea of what the, 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 the society is. And then they come to Toronto and they think, wow, this is there's too much change. But actually people who live there are, um, they welcome it. They welcome um, the, the various ways in which the, uh, the original community changes in relation to the newcomers, newcomers change. And so there is a kind of capacity, I think there's capacities on both sides, right? People, people like to be rooted, it is their place, but pl places change. New generations or people complain about them when they're old generations about the, what the young people do or migrants, but it, it, the, the evidence suggests that actually people do adjust and that the rates can be much, much higher, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to have a conversation about what the rate of change of what the rate is, especially to maintain our institutional practices, which um, and the kind of political community that we want to have. But I, I, you know, like just the fact that people might look different or dress different doesn't, um, doesn't challenge the political community on my account anyway. Um, and people can adjust to that. So it's, it's actually pretty hard to tell because it's these homogeneous communities that are often the most, the, the most hostile, at least in, at least in Canada. The same is true in the UK. It's definitely I mean, there's similar studies and uh, and in other parts of the uh, of the world. Yeah, in Switzerland, for example, when they had a vote on whether they're going to let more immigrants in in the the small cantons in the mountains where they rarely see any foreigner except for some tourists, they just said no, not more of them. Please spare us. Uh, whereas in in Geneva or in Zurich, they just said yeah, well, let them in. Where's the problem? Um, I think the you you again opened an interesting question, Margaret. There, um, whether the the constitutional robustness, like the general constitution, not the actual legal constitution, but the like the uh, constitutional um, understanding of a of a society, um, can bear this a certain amount of immigration, or where it it just might flip towards another side, and it's a a uh, question you brought up very carefully. Others like Paul Collier, for example, they address it a little bit more um, fervently. Um, I think an interesting question is, as I pointed out before, if you have nations like the United States, which have been forming themselves over the decades and centuries, um, you have a certain guarantee that people will, coming into the country, will confirm 
the, the constitutional setting and the mindset of a country because they decide to move there because of the setting. As you said, the liberal capital societies, many people moving there actually want to live in a society where nobody cares about questions of sexual orientation, about questions of what your kind of lifestyle you want to live, um, with whom you have business. So the like the positive outlook might be that actually, as you said yourself, also Margaret, and as Chandran always points out, that we can um, bear even more migration maybe because we can generally um, yeah, take the position that most people coming here will agree to our model of living and will even enforce and, and maybe revigorate our values of the open and liberal society. But that's just the optimist Clement speaking. Um, maybe there's some more critical people in the audience and that's why I would love to involve and include all of you now um, with your questions. So, you might either just raise your hand as it uh, as um, Zoom makes it possible, or you can just write your question to the chat, and then I will um, put it into our debate. So um, please, and if you if you have a question, then please uh, just briefly introduce yourself, who you are, and um, go ahead with your questions. So um, is Karen waving there? Uh, okay, Mark, yes, please, Mark. Oh, hi, um, yeah, I'm Mark Pennington from uh, King's College London. So I had a question that I think it really relates to both uh, Chandran and Margaret, and that's really just how much weight can be placed on this idea of collective self-determination. Because the very idea assumes that within a society, it is actually meaningful to speak about collective self-determination, that there is some kind of directional intelligence within a society that is able to control how that society evolves. And it's not obvious to me, even in quite small situations, uh, that that's the case. So if you think about the, the Brexit vote in the UK, people voted for Brexit for very different sorts of reasons. And the way the government is implementing the Brexit decision is morphing in different ways that none of the, those parties may necessarily have expected. So you have a case there where people thought they were exercising collective self-determination, but the results that emerge from this are actually something that nobody intended. So in situations like that, um, how can the notion of collective self-determination be used as the sort of criteria for when uh, people are deciding whether or not they're in control and thus how they might relate to an issue such as immigration? Would you like to go first, Margaret? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a very, um, I, I mean, so that question raises the problem. So, so there's really, so the idea of collective self-determination, um, I think is a kind of fundamental theoretical idea. And it's the idea that people exercise control over their collective conditions. And it's fundamental to all kinds of elements in political theory, because, um, because we have an idea that the institutions of the state should be responsive to the people and it's actually the people in the society for whom that 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 the, 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 the government's authorized by us okay and if we do if we reject that idea i think there's all kinds of institutions that don't make any sense okay so but the uh, but then i think there's a, a a very precise kind of problem which is that um People can't exercise self-determination without without some kind of democratic institutions. That is to say, we need we we disagree on a range of we could disagree and have conversations and have debates and that might frame kinds of conversations. But then we have institutional mechanisms to come to collective decisions, and so that's a kind of democratic problem. That it would be hard to think that a society could be completely collectively self-determining with, with people having some kind of collective voice unless there was some kind of democratic institutions. And these democratic institutions are often um, 
like not very good in many different ways. They're not very good in, in a whole range of ways. Like, so for example, it's not clear. It's, it's just actually not clear that a referendum is a very good way to exercise any kind of collective self-determination. The reason for that is a referendum says yes or no, and there's just many different reasons why people might say yes or no. It also, I mean, there's it, it all, it, it, it also, I mean, it, it, it has, there's all been all kinds of evidence about how difficult or, or, or how problematic a referendum is. So if people often think that a plebiscite is the best way, it probably isn't. So I don't know if that tells us that we can't be collectively self-determining as a people, um, um, that, that that isn't an important value, because if we don't have that idea, we have lost the idea of popular sovereignty. We've lost the idea about where, where uh, who the institutions of government should be responsible to. So, um, but the actual exercise of collective agency is of course a problem because we can only form a collective agent if we do so through mechanisms to make decisions. And these mechanisms are often flawed. I actually have written a piece on the problem of plebiscites and referendums, right? But, um, but, but you're right that, you know, you can't just appeal to collective self-determination without seeing whether we have a whole bunch of robust institutions that are, that are, that are um, important to making those decisions. I, th I think I have a slightly different uh, take, <clears throat> not um, completely contrary to what Margaret was saying, but still, I, I put the emphasis somewhat differently because I think the the problem with um, the claim and especially the language of self determination is that it suggests a level of collective control that isn't really there. Nonetheless, I think it's important to be able to make a distinction, for example, between you know, um, a peop a people's self-rule and say alien rule. Okay, if you're colonized, you're not uh, um, ruling yourselves in any way. Even if you um, don't have democratic institutions, and I disagree with Margaret on, on this here, um, you may still have, um, you know, a regime which you might as a subject of it regard as uh, one that's legitimate because you know these are the uh, um, you know the institutions that you've grown up with uh, and the legitimacy of the regime is simply given by the fact that everybody accepts that it rules and accepts um, the uh, the way in which it governs to say that this is self-determination in one sense seems to be like a complete overstatement because they're not uh, actively engaged. But on the other hand, they're not um, subject to alien rule. They're not subject to rule that they reject. So you, if, if you wanted a very thin conception of self-determination, then I think a legitimate regime is one in which there's self-determination. But if you really wanted the idea that, they, that the collective has a deep level of control, I think that's very, very hard to achieve you immediately get into all kinds of problems, even with democratic regimes of you know, preference aggregation, just to take one particular example. Thank you very much. Um, Karen? Yes, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you so much for this discussion. I find this very, very interesting and um, I'm just excited about it. Um, and for the little anecdote, Margaret, my my parents immigrated to Canada 60 years ago, and they found the Canadians extremely welcome. So that the mentality of the Canadians was really something that drilled them. And that's not exactly the case in other countries nowadays. Maybe mentalities are a topic that you could also touch upon at some point. I have a question, though, to um, Chandra, essentially. A rather famous German law professor and, and former federal court judge once said that the institutions that we need to maintain a liberal democracy, such as, well, the, the rules for our parliamentary system, the federal court, amongst other things, uh, who enforces the law, uh, the rule of law, etc. All these things cannot exist without national borders. It's a concept that is somehow linked to, well, to a territorial defined aggregate. Yes? So 
for him, it was just not conceivable, and that's probably true for all lawyers, <laughs> that um, these structures could be in some kind of flux. Um, look at it historically, I, I, I understand him. <laughs> it is very difficult to imagine that these structures can be changing, can be overlapping, can change from one day to the next. I want to ask you how you envisage this, and, and, and maybe you will have to draw on another book that you wrote. Um, I would encourage you to do so. I think it, we need to understand a little bit better how it is possible to think of a different world with more flexible um, structures for the kind of institutions that we consider robust and, 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 and healthy. Um, well, firstly, I, I definitely agree that institutions are important and legal institutions are particularly important. Uh, I agree that one way of demarcating the scope or the extent of legal institutions is um, by territorial demarcation, but it's not necessary or, or essential. I mean, there are uh, laws that appeal to that, that apply to people regardless of where they are territorially. Um, anyone who's uh, subject to US taxes, I think, is, is aware of that. Um, I think it's also the case that you can have um, you know, free movement across jurisdictions without the jurisdictions themselves uh, becoming endangered. The most obvious example here is the EU, where there is, in fact, freedom of movement, but there are independent jurisdictions and they, they continue to operate. They've not been undermined. I think before that, you can point to the case of the British Empire, which had both multiple jurisdictions and uh, a tradition of the common law that um, you know, made its presence uh, felt both um, you know, culturally and institutionally in a large number of countries, which developed their own um, uh, you know, common law systems to the extent that the precedents that they set became important precedents in English law, just despite the, the differences in jurisdictions. So from what I've, um, you know, um, heard you say, I, th I think that particular statement may be, may be an overstatement, uh, even though, you know, the connection between uh, law or institutions and territory is not simply entirely accidental or irrelevant. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, would you like to add something or? Fine. Um, then I have the next question by Justus, please. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Justus. I'm a PhD student at King's College London and currently uh, at NYU as a research fellow. And in our political theory uh, classes in the last weeks, we had fervent discussions about immigration control and in how far it relates to rights of equality between the citizenry. And the question that came up is in how far extensive bundles of political and economic rights that the self-governing citizenry gives itself relates to fewer and tighter immigration controls. So the question is whether there is a trade-off between rights like the right to vote, the right to certain economic benefits, like for example, a universal basic income or unemployment benefits and things like that, that the self-governing citizenry gives itself actually tightens um, the, um, the influx of additional immigrants. And I wondered in how far um, that's another trade off that one can make, because on the one hand, Margaret said that there is this right to, and Chandra kind of agreed to the right of the self-governing citizenry to, and to regulate itself and to make rules for themselves. But whether you would agree that there is a trade-off of that every additional right that the citizenry get, gets actually prevents additional immigration to happen. Um, yeah, I was wondering about your feedback there. Yeah, I, I don't think there necessarily is a trade-off or that the trade-offs are the same uh, everywhere or have to be the same everywhere. Let, let me give you an example. Um, I lived for 12 years in the UK um, 
as uh, a professor at the London School of Economics. Because I came from Australia and hold Australian citizenship, I had the right to vote in not only local, but also national elections. I could, if I wanted to, after I gained permanent residence, stand for parliament, but I could not get a British passport, right? That was not a, a right that I had. Now in the United States, you can't vote unless you are an American citizen. Although um, some states have been um, more lax in the way in which it, uh, in which they, they um, you know, police and monitor these sorts of things. So pretty much you can do whatever you want, I think, politically. Um, I don't think there is any real reason why there must be trade-offs made in one way or the other. If the uh, British state decided that um, you know, all members of the uh, former EU um, could, or sorry, the EU of which it was formerly a member, could now vote in British elections, it could. Um, and, and I don't think it would uh, cause a collapse. I don't think it would mean that you'd suddenly need to control immigration. You, you might feel that you need to, but actually, you know, the, uh, the regulations around the world suggest that uh, trade-offs are made in so many different ways um, that one sometimes wonders whether they even trade-offs at all. Uh, can, can I come in? Yes. So it does. So so it intuitively seems that if we give more economic rights, then we're going to try to restrict it. That does seem in kind of an intuitive trade-off. And um, so I agree with Chandran that it it's, it doesn't always look like societies do that. So in Canada, we have like protected person status. Well, while, while their determination, I think there's Iraqis and protected a lot of Iraqis have a protected person status. Well, and they can work. For a, a, while it's being determined so they can enter but in lots of places they actually won't let them work and they'll support them they won't let them enter the labor market so it's so i agree with chandran that it, it can it can work very differently but but i mean just to note that what the real trade-off is that people aren't really willing to make is the idea that we have equality of citizenship I mean, I think that at, at a fundamental level, that is must be the trade-off because there would be lots of people who might be prepared to come to affluent societies and have no political citizenship and not get any welfare rights. And they would just want the right to work. They would be happy with that. That would be better than their own current situation. But what we're unprepared to do is to say, ah, we, so we wanna say we have equal, we don't want to have a, a class of people who aren't actually in the society, that live in the society, but are not full equal citizens, because we fear that that might actually be a, a destructive, it's hierarchical, it's problematic in a variety of ways. So in so although in the margins, you can't see the direct trade-off, what there is a trade-off, what, what it does seem that we're unprepared to do is to just say, you know what, if you want to come and work, come and work, just don't use any of our benefits. We're not prepared to do that as a society. Well, in Canada, in Europe, in many different places. And that's because I think that we're very committed to the idea that within a territorial domain, we have equal citizenship, equal political rights, that in some way our entitlements and um, are, are the same. And, to, and, and so we don't make that move. So in the British case, when, when I first arrived in the UK, my, my uh, work permit for five years said not entitled to public benefits. But after I'd been there for five years, I, I still was not um, entitled to citizenship. I, I was not even entitled to uh, indefinite leave to remain until I applied for it and eventually uh, got it. But by that stage, I already had all kinds of welfare rights. I mean, from the beginning, I had access to the National Health Service, which partly was a result of just being Australian. There are you know, reciprocal arrangements, but also as a taxpayer, you were entitled to those things. Um, you know, here then you might ask, well, to what extent do you want to say that um, entitlement to certain sorts of welfare rights comes not with um, political status, but say taxpayer status, which is quite different. And I think it can be cut in all kinds of ways. I, I don't think there's any natural or obvious way to do it. And my guess is that the, the populace doesn't have a shared view on this. 
I think some people would be indifferent. Others might say, no, you've got to be, you know, a fully 100% certified citizen American before you can access anything. Um, you know, I think there'd be lots of different views on this. Yeah, I was just thinking about the situation in Germany where um, you immediately have a lot of access to many benefits, um, which was part of the problem uh, in communicating us uh, welcoming many, many, many refugees in 2015, 2016, because people basically saw how the benefit budget was just rising with every person coming into the country. Um, so, but at the same time, um, there's a broad consensus that we would not treat people differently just because they do not have a citizenship. Um, so that's, I, I guess, as you said, it's, it's, it varies to the political cultures in countries too, or what is acceptable, um, what is considered appropriate and right. Um, so I have Niklas next on the list. Uh, thank you, Clemens. So I'm Niklas Berggren. I'm an associate professor of economics in Stockholm and Prague. Um, I have a question, I think, mainly for Chandran, and that is how the present argument relates to the argument of the young Chandran in the liberal, liberal archipelago. And uh, more particularly, as I interpreted uh, that work, uh, you really don't mind, should we say, a large scale setting with different communities with different types of rules for, for their inhabitants. So there could be some enclaves or some communities with rather illiberal rules, uh, for instance, restricting entry and exit from that community. Uh, so is your present argument to, to be understood as a questioning of that sort of global model um, in a way of self-determination in, 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 in a certain sense? Uh, or is it, or do you still accept that model? Perhaps uh, then your argument can be seen as a plea to each community to in fact uh, not introduce that kind of restriction that uh, prohibit or make entry and exit into or from the communities in question difficult. Uh, also with the ensuing um, restrictions on liberty within the community that follow from such restrictions. Uh, so do you question the overall sort of, would you like everybody to stop, would you like to stop uh, communities that restrict entry and exit, or do you find that kind of order legitimate, but trying to get them to see uh, sort of, better how to organize their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for calling me the, the younger Chandran. I think that's the, I think of it as the, the old and older, but you know, maybe your version is, uh, is better. Um, I, I do think um, that the, the two works you mentioned are consistent. And I think the way that I think about them is in one of the ways that you mentioned, which is to say, uh, I think of a, uh, of a free society as one in which um, people don't have the, the, the claim or the authority to force or require people to live in particular ways. Um, but given that we have to uh, associate, most of the time we have to compromise and live with one another, uh, not always on the terms we most prefer. So to that extent, we often find ourselves, uh, you know, in uh, communities, both you know, economic and political that we don't entirely agree with. Um, since I think that we don't have the, uh, the warrant for preventing people from, sorry, for requiring people to live in the way that we would prefer, we have no, no warrant for, pre pre for preventing them from, from leaving. But equally, I don't think there's any reason that we can give to require uh, other communities to admit people. Okay. What I want to do in this particular book is to say, nonetheless, um, you should consider actually the importance of letting people in if you in fact care about freedom, if you want not only 
the whole to be free, but your own society to be free. Because if what you want to do is to, uh, you know, control entry and exit to a greater and greater degree, then you will have to uh, recognize that you'll end up controlling yourself. So if freedom is something that you care about, and, and I'm, you know, um, quite aware that not everybody does care about this and acknowledge that uh, in my book. And I acknowledge that people care about it to different degrees. Some, you know, um, hold freedom very dear. And for some, it's, it's not a good to be traded off. I want to say that if you really value, value it, then you will not only be reluctant to, um, you know, prevent people from leaving, but you'll also be open to allowing them to enter. Okay, so uh, I have Johannes next on the list. We actually cannot hear you at the moment, Johannes. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Because um, I just entered a new bureau, so everything is different at the moment. Um, uh, my name is Johannes Staudt from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, I'm working actually on modern European history, so um, this is why my following statement comes a bit from the scratch. But um, as of recent, I accidentally came about um, uh, the argument that uh, the the um, the stability or the, the success of the Roman Empire compared to the to the Greek, um, let's say, mini empires um, of Athens and, and Sparta, um, what had its had its um, internal factor or its internal cause on the fact that the Greeks were very reluctant with giving citizenship and political rights just to the, like the the old um, il, um, elites and the 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 um, uh, uh, families of long-standing citizenship, um, whereas the the Romans also connected political rights to the some um, some status of citizenship, but um, they were very uh, liberal in giving the um, various kinds of citizenships to um, uh, also to let's say foreigners or um, um, yeah, um, peoples or, or at least at least the elites of those peoples they. Um, um, they got control of um, through their expansion. Um, and what I wonder, um, given that um, that argument or factor, what I wonder is um, if the the fact that we now, um, at least in Europe, live in, um, in um, democratic nation states, um, that there might be a trade-off between um, the fact that we live in a democratic nation state and the um, the um, the um, tendencies to to limit immigration because um, when the 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 idea of a nation state came up the the nation state or the, the idea of democracy was very much connected to the idea of um, um, uh, the the state having responsibility towards the citizen and the the um, the the um, the identification of the citizen with the state um, had to be much higher in a, in a democratic nation state instead of, for example, uh, an imperial state where you where it was somehow enough that you did not um, identify yourself with the state, but where it was enough that you just accept who is the leader. And um, I wonder if this this tendency to limit immigration is somehow higher. Given that um, yeah, connection to the, um, um, of the of the single citizen to the nation state, and I would love to hear your your opinion on that point. If I might just uh, briefly jump in, this is interestingly enough also an argument that Popper makes in his uh, book on the Open Society, where he mentions the nationalist Greek states versus the inclusive uh, Roman Empire. So if you want to check that. Uh, Go to Popper, but um, now, of course, our experts. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I have um, a lot of expertise here, uh, particularly when it comes to, to Greek and uh, and Roman history. Though, of course, the the Romans um, did uh, extend citizenship far and wide um, by conquest, which is uh, also a, a 
slightly curious way of uh, giving people certain sorts of uh, uh, rights, whether you whether you want it or not. Um, but just turning to the to the case of uh, of democratic states, what does strike me is that um, over time they've exhibited very different uh, attitudes to the question of immigration, uh, different attitudes to be held um, either by the elites or by um, or by the by the citizenry. I mean, in the American case, clearly the the Declaration of Independence complains about George the Third having prevented immigration. Um, uh, if you look, if you go back to the you know um, the presidential debate for the for the for the not for the Republican nomination in I think 1980 when George Bush and Ronald Reagan debated, they were falling over each other to show that one was more pro-immigration uh, than the other. I mean, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, we've got, you know, a, a very different set of circumstances. And of course, you know, this is without even going into the question of uh, what kinds of people the elites or the population want immigration from. You could be very keen on some kinds of immigration and very much against other kinds. So um, I think one thing is clear that in democratic politics, there's always the, um, the possibility that um, there will be votes in a pro-immigration or an anti-immigration vote uh, um, stance. And it will depend not only on the time, but also on the election, on the specific electorates in question. Um, and you know, how it all washes out, I think, you know, is something that's pretty much impossible to predict because democratic po politics is, is, if nothing else, uh, in a continually in a state of flux. Margaret, would you? Well, I, I have no expertise on this either. <laughs> so I thought Chandran, you showed expertise there. But um, I, I mean, it does seem that, I mean, I mean, I guess there's really two, at least two kinds of questions, right? A bit implicit. Um, one is um, whether given that people are the, given that the people already existing citizens are people who are likely to exercise their political vote, are they likely to be restrictive of immigration given that they're the ones being asked? That's, I guess, one kind, and they might take different views and it might be connected to whether they think that there is benefits to be had for them. Um, but of course, but what we have is no real representation of any kind of external view here, right? So, and this, so in that sense, it might be that there is a, a kind of um, bias towards being exclusive. But I, I also think that being a democracy doesn't necessarily, I mean, that if you think about societies where, like suppose China takes over Tibet, which it did, and then suppose it became democratized, then the fact that then if you run the, if you run the, depending on how, so the whole domain is China and the, the votes of Tibetans will be completely, um, uh, they'll be completely outvoted by the Chinese unless you do something to make the, to, unless, you, unless you draw boundaries to give the, or, do, or have mechanisms to actually specially represent Tibetans. So in many societies, they can extend equal democratic citizenship without any real consequence for the majority in lots of different cases. So on the one hand, yes, the, 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 the fact that the, the, the citizens are the ones making decisions means that there's a kind of exclusive bias, but sometimes you can extend democratic voice without really any kind of consequences, depending on the demography and depending on what kind of inst democratic institutions you have. And um, so it's it's actually, so in that sense, there's it's not really clear, I think. Actually, one really obvious uh, example has just struck me is the case of the, uh, the Brexit referendum. Um, many citizens, uh, non-citizens, I'm sorry, had the right to vote, people like myself, um, um, who are also not members of the EU, but uh, uh, EU citizens in the UK did not have the right to vote in the in the Brexit referendum. Um, and clearly, um, if they'd had the right to vote, you would have had a very different outcome. Um, and there's no na obvious or natural way to say uh, who is the correct electorate. Yeah, um, thank you, Deirdre.
You still mute? Yes. Yes. Uh, I I I came a little late to this uh, extremely interesting uh, discussion because I got confused about the time. Um, I am not very good at arithmetic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as, a, as an economist, I'd be extremely interested in the opinions of the, of the speakers about the old economic point. It's um, easily half a century and more old, actually more like 90 years old by now, that the immigration of people into a country has the same economic effects as trade with those people. Um, if uh, Juan Valdez in Colombia is free to send his coffee to the United States, it has, in this economic sense, the same effect on, on all prices and wages as if one is admitted to the United States. Uh, of course, he also has to bring his, uh, his hills where he grows his coffee, but mm, you, you understand the point that there is a, uh, a trade-off, a substitution between free trade and free migration. Um, I, I do address that indirectly. Um, in my book in the in the economics chapter yeah. in addressing uh, a particular um, argument made by uh, an, an, uh, some economists and one in particular George Borjas to say that um, in order to protect the, um, the economic well-being of uh, American workers it would be important to um, um, to, to limit immigration um, because of their, their competing against American workers uh, um, either for employment or for, for higher wages. And, you know, I made the argument that um, those American workers could suffer just as much if um, the workers in other parts of the world who are excluded um, decided to then you know, turn their, you know, their attention and energies to um, economic development, in which case they would produce uh, more, their goods would compete with the, the goods uh, produced in, uh, in America, the um, you know, firms in question then which would have to compete on price um, and you'd get pretty much the same effect. So yeah. if you really were looking to protect the American workers, you might do that in the short term, by, uh, by immigration controls. But if you really wanted to do it, then you'd have to also make sure that the, uh, that the labor outside of the United States was not going to become competitive. So you'd probably also want to make sure you didn't spend any money on economic development overseas. Yeah, but, but, but you should understand, and, and I hope you do, that this argument is much older uh, than, <laughs> than, than George, who's an yeah. outlier. In economics, it it goes back to the um, Heckscher Olin discussion in the 1930s, and Paul Samuelson had a lot to say, say about it. It and uh, M Mundell and more modern times, the same thing. So it's it's not just about protectionism, although I must say that George is strangely inconsistent on this. Mm -hmm. Is I, I was a bit surprised to find myself uh, making that argument against a, a labor economist, but uh, um, I, I checked with my economist friends and they told me I was right. So, yeah, that's right. You you, you are right. Yes. Um, so thank you very much. We are approaching. Um, 4.45 in Berlin time. Um, and as I already communicated towards uh, Margaret and Chandran, this will be the time where I start to get a little bit uncomfortable so that everybody can get back to their work and we can just relax a little bit after one and a half hours, more than one and a half hours of uh, discussion and uh, wrapping our mind about things. Um, but I would 
still have one last question for each one of you. Um, so I would want to hear from you one point which you would take away from this discussion, which you hadn't thought about before, which was new to you, which was an interesting insight. But in order for you to think about which point that might be, I would just um, start by um, thanking all of you for attending, for watching, um, also those who are, will be watching in the future, uh, for paying attention to this very important um, topic. I would like to thank Karen for giving me the opportunity to moderate this because uh, migration, the question of national identity and all that stuff is my favorite subject of all time. So um, it was very exciting for me also, uh, especially I would like to thank Margaret and Chandran for making themselves available uh, and sharing all their insights, all their interesting thoughts with us. And I am pretty sure that if anybody has any more questions or suggestions or whatever, you can always contact them and uh, try to um, enhance this discourse uh, way uh, out of this, just this small moment, um, but try to bring debates into a continuity of time, uh, develop them, and learn from each other. So a big, big thank you to all of you and especially to Margaret and Chanran for this very, very inspiring and insightful and uh, question raising debate. And that's the best one can say about a debate when you leave it with new questions. So um, finally, Chanran, which new thing have you learned? What was your take from this discussion? Um, I think really there are, there are a couple of things. Firstly, um, I think from, from Margaret's um, comments, um, I certainly got a, a better sense of how um, a part of my book is, uh, uh, has been read. Uh, and uh, I think in, in particular, you know, when I, when I wrote the, the seventh chapter on the, uh, uh, on the state, um, I, I, I thought of it um, not so much as saying something particularly um, provocative, let alone polemical, but you know, I, I've, I've come to accept that it is much more provocative and polemical than, uh, than I thought. Not that I resile from, uh, um, from, uh, from any of it, but uh, um, but I, I also, you know, it certainly given me pause in trying to think about, you know, um, how I want to you know, present my views, particularly given that, you know, what I want to stress is the the nature of the trade off between um, levels of freedom and um, and immigration control. And as Margaret, I think, rightly points out, you know, if it's just a choice between Im immigration control and freedom, you pick freedom every time. But actually, in a way, it's um, it's a trade-off of a subtler kind because it's how much immigration control do you want and how much freedom do you want to give up? Um, and I think that's a little bit clearer to me now from, uh, from Margaret's uh, uh, comments. It was also very helpful to, uh, to, to get some questions about the relationship between this book and my, and my previous uh, one. And each time I try to answer it, I, uh, I realize uh, one or two uh, things that I hadn't thought of before. So. Thank you uh, for that from everyone. And also, if I missed, make sure I get a chance, thank you again, Karen and uh, Clemens and uh, everyone here and Margaret especially for, uh, for this event. Thank you, Chandra. Margaret, uh, what, what is your takeaway from this event? Um, well, I guess maybe two. One was I was surprised at, um, how much I actually agreed with Chandran, like in the book, but also in the dialogue, which um, worries me <laughs> in a sort of way. And then I, um, but then, you know, Chandran has this like completely reasonable style. So it, it, it brings you in and you think you have to agree. And, um, and also I think one of the things that came up in the various different questions about different places is just how, um, how the, the, the trade-offs really don't, they're not, 
I mean, we might think of them as political theorists, as trade-offs of values, but much of it depends on the institutional design, right? There's better and worse institutional design. And these institutional designs, I mean, often these trade-offs aren't necessary trade-offs, right? That they're trade-offs that are made because of bad, um, because of the way in which they're they're incorporated, right? Like, so there's no fundamental trade-off. There isn't, there isn't always a necessary trade-off, let's say, between affordable housing and having high levels of migration. This is being faced in Canada right now because we have hugely unaffordable housing and the government's committed to 400,000 new migrants. And it's, um, and I mean, there's no necessary trade-offs. We should build more houses. We should be building, we should be building more houses for a long, long time because millennials can't buy them. But nevertheless, in particular policy situations, you do sometimes face trade-offs and that might involve rates, it might involve commitments. Like, so they're not, um, so one of the things that struck me with the various different questions was how much you have to know contextually in order to talk reasonably about the way in which we should imagine these trade-offs and how much there's a gap between normative political theory, like talking about values, and then how those values are institutionalized in different societies or in different economies to realize them. So I, I, I was struck by that as we were talking with people having various different kinds of expertise that I didn't have. So yeah, and, but, and I also just want to say thank you to everybody because this has been a really um, helpful kind of dialogue in crystallizing my own views and helping me think through some of the things. So thanks very much to the organizers and Chandran for writing writing the book that sparked it all. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. You gave us uh, the final cue uh, to think ahead and to think about new questions. And I think um, that's what news is about. And um, I hope to see you again soon in different contexts, um, if anyhow possible life. If not, we now have the benefits of being together, um, at least virtually. Um, come to our new spotlights, come to the white beams, um, acknowledge that there are other activities by news, for example, our upcoming conference on uh, democracy, where there's also a call for papers going around and a lot of other stuff. And uh, thank you all and see you soon. Have a great day. Thank you, Clemens. This was lovely. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye.